All right, and our first talk is Shafraz. I will sort of do a quick intro with that. As I explained to Shafraz this morning, I tried to think of how I actually know Shafraz, and I, I don't actually know how I know Shafraz. Shafraz is sort of one of those people that if you're involved in the city, or involved in design, or involved in something progressive, it's difficult to escape him in, in some sort of way. Most likely, we, we've worked on a bunch of things together for the city, or I don't even know in that sort of way. As it says here right at the top in my bio, he's a passionate citizen. And I find it difficult to think of a better way of sort of uh, encapsulating within here. But I'll talk a little bit about that nonetheless. Um, so Shafraz is an integrated project delivery expert and architect who thrives on facilitating problem solving of any kind that is ecologically aware. He's previously known for his work at Manask Isaac Architects where he focused on net zero energy and carbon emission reducing goals for buildings. Now he facilitates the creation of regenerative, net zero energy and carbon neutral architecture using lean culture and design thinking. He brings together architects, engineers, trades, contracts, clients and passion, it's not, not really in the bio there, but to enable high performance results. And over the last 20 years, he's made significant contributions to the design and cultural landscape of Edmonton, mainly through founding MADE, Media Architecture Design Edmonton. And Shafraz is going to give a talk today called Climate Emergency, Emergency Time to Demand a Better World. So if everybody can help me welcome Shafraz. <laughs> Thank you, Aiden. Uh, hopefully this works. Yeah, we're gonna see. Max huh? and PCs talking together. Oh, it already. Oh, that's looking promising. It's looking promising. <laughs> so um, I have a bit of, uh, I guess, uh, vulnerability uh, to express. I, I have deep climate anxiety, uh, <laughs> and and it kind of is um, based on the work I've done for the last 20 years in sustainable building and uh, seeing how little progress we've made. Um, and, and I really admire Greta, who was here uh, not too long ago for, for taking up uh, a voice, especially a youthful, very passionate voice, and uh, giving the world sort of a, a kind of a, a reckoning of sorts. And, and it's only through people like uh, Greta Thunberg and some of my mentors, uh, my fellow uh, architects at Manask Isaac who taught me a lot about sustainability and net zero energy buildings and, and things like that, that I'm able to overcome that anxiety to do more work and to have been able to start almost a year ago now a company called Ask for a Better World. So, we try to help clients um, value align around making buildings, making even systems uh, actively helpful in, in regenerating our, our world. And as, as many of you probably know, some of the data or the science or the, this, this is the, the Al Gore hockey stick graph. Like, atmospheric CO2 has never exceeded that little dashed line or that almost uh, just over 300 parts per million of CO2 in our atmosphere. We just passed 350 and we're quickly going to 400 and uh, if we're by, by centuries end we'll be way 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 up here and I, I don't understand why people still don't believe science or don't sort of understand that we've never, for the last 800,000 years, gone over that in any real sense. And uh, if we don't take care of it in an urgent and sustained manner, we're going to kind of wreck our world. And we only have one of them. And I, I kind of want to give you all the bad news first. So. <laughs> so uh, I hope I don't depress you too much, and I hope I don't get too, um, I don't know, curled up into a ball underneath this table. But, um, but essentially, that's why we have the Paris Climate Agreement. And I want to make sure you understand the, con the global down to the local context of why this is important. Does anyone know what the Paris Agreement says, or is for, or? 
Andy does? Well, anyway, it's an agreement to help each country, and 197 countries agreed to this uh, a kind of statement to, to try and keep the world temperature from rising more than 1.5 degrees or keeping uh, carbon emissions down to, to something that will not go over two degrees eventually. And, and they've been talking about this for 30 years and they keep um, making these agreements which then turned into national uh, policy. So Canada has created the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change. And then Alberta, when we had an NDP government, created the Climate Leadership Plan, which took that and tried to implement on a provincial level how we're going to contain our CO2 emissions through all of our industries, through all of the way we build our society, down to the way we live. And uh, as you know, they are no longer in government, and this plan has been kind of uh, repealed. So now what? And how do, we, how do we actually come to terms with actually doing something when there's nothing um, preventing us, or policy or legislation-wise, from trying to aim for that all-important 1.5 degree Celsius? Um, and if we don't do that, we're going to have summers more like this, right? A couple summers ago, we woke up to Blade Runner 2049, and I, I kind of rubbed my eyes when I got out of it. Like, what? Can, I can drop f bombs, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a bit of street, street what the heck is going on? Um, and this isn't the first time our province has seen uh, the world on fire. Th this is uh, northern Alberta, like. Fort McMurray was on fire. Slave Lake was on fire. Um, and not only fire, Calgary was underwater. And like, how do we get over the idea the entire downtown of Calgary flooded for some reason other than climate change? And what, what boggles my mind is how quickly they cleaned it up and kind of went on day-to-day -day business as usual and keep on doing that. It's like, Stampede was less than a month away, and it's amazing what people can do when they're motivated. Why can't we take that same motivation to climate change? And that's sort of uh, the crazy uh, anxiety I get. It's like we have the energy, the resources, the uh, the ability to do amazing things. Why aren't we doing them? Why aren't we doing them fast enough? I'm going to show you the next. Third, um, this is what Edmonton is projected to be in 2050 if we don't take care of our climate. So on the left is our current river valley shot at a vantage point. This is the actual climate model the city of Edmonton did in the Energy, Energy Transition Advisory Committee, which I'm a co-chair of currently, to say if we don't start to actually take care of our even local ecosystem and do our part, we're gonna look like Calgary looks like. We're gonna turn into dry, arid grassland, and a lot of our river valley trees will die because we don't have enough precipitation due to the uh, ecosystem moving northwards from where it is down in southern Alberta. We're gonna see that change. We have to start giving people that context and uh, frankly, starting to light their bums on fire to do something because we have to. We have to do this, otherwise, all of you are going to have to buy this book. Because the worst case scenario is is going to be in your lifetimes. It's not your children's lifetimes. It's your lifetimes. We will begin to see, and we have seen things happen that are. Um, getting a little crazy up there. So uh, I think our industry is broken, especially the design and construction industry, the industrial industry. We continue to want to build pipelines, uh, even though that we know this literally fuels the, 
the climate change that we're trying to prevent. And we, we also take a lot of things for granted, like our resources. So uh, Canadians are one of the largest consumers of water in the world. We, uh, per capita, use uh, almost 20 liters per person per day. And it's, it sounds like a small amount, but when you add that all up, it's, it's going to basically have us having very little fresh water in your lifetime. Um, what me as an architect fears is our inability to do something about CO2 emissions that are produced by buildings, because I can't convince developers and builders that they're doing it wrong. Like, buildings conventionally um, are basically contributing a huge amount of our CO2 emissions just because they're not designed with the natural resources that are available to us and in a way that actually makes sense for our climate. Um, believe it or not, all of the steam that you see rising from those buildings uh, if it's an office building, that steam is from a chiller creating air conditioning inside a building when it's 30 below. That is because the sun is heating the south side of the glass of a building and creating essentially a greenhouse effect in the southern part of that building, triggering the air conditioning system to think it needs to cool that space. Whereas the north side of the space is going, oh my god, it's 30, minus 30 out, it's super cold, I need to heat the north half of that building. And so the building's system in between is, is doing both heating and cooling at the same time, when essentially all we have to do is tell the air conditioning system, just open your vent to the outside where you have super cold air to cool the south side of the space for free energy. Those chillers are using natural gas to make air conditioning in minus 30. That's perverse. <laughs> it, it drives me absolutely bad when, when I know that this is constantly what we're fighting against. And then because of that, buildings consume about 30% of all the energy as a society we produce, right? It, it can, all of the natural gas, all of the oil, all of the solar, all of the wind energy buildings by their need for electric lights, by their need for mechanical systems, air conditioning, all of that kind of sucks all a third, almost a third of all the energy we ever produce. And um, that too drives me absolutely crazy because we can actually produce net zero energy buildings in our climate and we can, we can do that without having to be kind of ridiculously energy hogs in this. Does everyone know what a net zero energy building is? So just very quickly, it's a building that can produce as much energy as it needs to use up in the course of one entire year. So in the summertime, it usually generates more energy because in the wintertime, it needs to uh, basically take energy from a grid or from some other system. And it's usually powered by solar or a geo exchange system where it can generate more due to sunlight, due to heat gain, due to you know the natural capital around us. Um, if any of you have burning questions during the talk, just raise your hand or shout them out. Happy to clarify or answer. Um, this also bugs me. Up to half of our landfill waste is from construction. And again, it's because our industry doesn't value resources, it values uh, labor. So we pay people very, very high price per hour to cut lumber, and it's easy for them when they cut a two by four and they only need two feet of it from an eight foot length to discard the rest of the six feet rather than putting aside that six foot length in a pile to then come back to later to sort through to cut another two foot length 
It's, it's ridiculous. I actually heat my home uh, with a wood fireplace with construction waste because I go to construction sites and I dumpster dive in their bins and, and grab all of those little tiny two foot lengths they don't bother to reuse. And uh, it's, it's kind of silly, but it, you know, I think uh, our lack of productivity in construction and even in the design process is, is part of the massive problem we have to fix. And it's kind of the opposite of manufacturing or industry that have figured out how to be more effective. So the blue line are uh, productivity in, in manufacturing facilities that have used the assembly line or used the lean process or, or have optimized the system, whereas construction, or sorry, sorry, blue is construction, whereas the productive productivity of manufacturing has really taken off. Construction has actually gotten worse in the last 50 years. And again, is it boggles my mind. So, uh, as an architect, um, we've only just begun to have this conversation in any serious form. Uh, a lot of architecture is really about starchitecture and making very flashy, expensive, you know, show-stopping buildings, and it hasn't really considered up until the last two years how to deal with climate change, energy, materials, and resources until this last summer where the American Institute of Architects finally declared through their annual general meeting an urgent and sustained action on the climate emergency. This is a big deal because architects, uh, as, as I pointed out, have a huge influence on the energy, on the construction, on the material resource, on the water, all of those things that buildings consume and, and operate with. We, we have a huge obligation, I think, as a professional to try and do our utmost to, to deal with that waste. And, and thank goodness our own Royal Architectural Institute of Canada followed suit this fall uh, with that same sort of urgent and sustained action declaration. So now, uh, frankly, I am obligated slash um, I guess my professional ethics now demands that I deal with this challenge. But I can uh, sadly say uh, not a lot of my colleagues are still taking this seriously. But um, hopefully we will in, in short order as we, we, even as a city, the city of Edmonton has declared a climate emergency. So I think we're, we're beginning to think differently and more and more people are beginning to take sort of Greta's words to heart and start to design and think differently in terms of the buildings we create. Because honestly, our buildings last for a very long time. And uh, there's now a little bit of discourse around it. So just very quickly, we're finally seeing uh, uh, the IPCC, who developed the whole Paris Agreement, um, follow through into our city level kind of guiding documents. So if the province isn't gonna help set the tone for doing something about the environment, this our own city is. And it's absolutely, uh, I guess, brilliantly um, positive to see Mayor Iveson create the Edmonton Declaration. He actually has all of North America signing up uh, to the declaration that commits their city and their resources to meeting the Paris Agreement. So trying as hard as we possibly can to contain the amount of carbon emissions and to, to start to seriously think of how we're gonna do that. So um, our new city plan will be based on how we're going to meet the Paris Climate Agreement ideas and therefore our whole city and the way we develop will change. This Saturday, I think IDEA is doing a, a walk about in Old Strathcona around parking. We're finally considering the idea we shouldn't have parking minimums and maybe the, the age of the car 
or the personal uh, private automobile might be over. Because that is a huge part of the problem as well. So we, we thank goodness, as a city, are, are doing some of our part to help make the case. And we can see that in uh, documents, uh, especially in the adaptation strategy and action plan, where we acknowledge we're, you know what, we're, we're essentially fucked. So we need to start to think of how we're going to adapt to that image of the river valley with no trees. How are we going to adapt when a lot of our homes do not have air conditioning when we will need it in hotter, drier summers? And how we're going to deal with the water and challenges of, of that kind of uh, scenario. So the Edmonton Declaration basically says, in order to stay below the 1.5 degree warming, we have to create a carbon budget. The, the world's climate budget, or carbon budget, sorry, is almost 2,800 gigatons of CO2 that we are, that basically we can admit to, to be able to stay within the world going hotter than two degrees Celsius. Um, basically, uh, we need to start to reduce that to 600 gigatons in the next little while. Otherwise, we are going to basically um, have, have, a, have a planet like Mars, essentially. So that, that kind of tells us we have to really get off of fossil fuels and get off of anything that basically emits carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, uh, methane, any kind of greenhouse gas. So the world has to stay in, like try to take their 2,800 gigatons and, and focus on trying to get that down to 600. And Edmonton's budget for carbon is 155 megatons. Well, so every city in the world has begun to understand what their carbon allowance is. And, and essentially, that helps us create the scenarios or the game plans of how we need to basically, within a decade, figure out how we're going to transition from a very carbon intensive world to a carbon neutral world. So a world where we don't emit carbon, where we don't create carbon, <coughs> and we start to embody carbon in materials or sequester carbon or figure out a way to capture it out of the uh, atmosphere into to things. There's actually a neat company in Calgary called Clean O2 that scrubs carbon dioxide out of chimney pipes and compresses the carbon into uh, a type of glycerin to make soaps. So it's, it's, it, there are interesting technologies, but they're not at a scale where you can capture enough to, to really deal with the problem. We need any and all things to help us uh, reduce this. Um, so Edmonton's declaration said, suggests we need to have these six different major shifts in thinking. So creating the tools and targets to get to that carbon budget, uh, to um, create a low carbon city and zero emission transportation, uh, we just bought a whole fleet of electric buses that will roll out this spring, I hope. We are figuring out how to make emission neutral buildings. So again, this is trying to convince our entire building industry that within a decade, you can't put in a natural gas boiler. You can't put in you know, a chiller that uses gas again. You can't think the way you've been thinking for the last 100 years. Uh, we have to create a renewable revolution and start to really ramp up solar, wind, and anything else we can harness um, carbon neutral energy. And we have to think of, as I mentioned, negative emissions where we can sequester carbon. And the, the most interesting part, which is, I think, brilliant, is the just and equitable transition. So our society is actually really well off. We, we have a lot of things we take for granted, like water from the tap that Equor puts in our pipes, 
or reliable electricity. But there's people in our city that are living rough in the river valley that have that, that are lighting fires to stay warm. How are we going to create a just and equitable transition uh, for people who have no means to, to influence a building or who have no house, who have no opportunity? And that, that's, that's a, an amazing um, realization in and of itself for us to deal with. But we're dealing with it sector by sector bit by bit, everything from creating car-free zones, and I've circled the ones that relate to buildings, so all new commercial buildings, all new existing buildings that need to be retrofitted, all new residential, all of these have to have this declining impact of emissions on our city to be able to meet that. Um, and essentially, it, we have to tackle everything down to land use intensification. So we, we still have arguments within the city about density and, and how to create a compact city and not bleed out into the suburbs. We still have debates on whether or not to build LRT lines instead of just building another lane on the Anthony Hende for some weird reason. Um, we, we are trying to shift the thinking to make that happen. And um, again, I, I feel a little bit better when I work with enlightened people at the city who are starting to map this out uh, in very, very definite ways of how to do it. So in the in the middle, number three, mission neutral buildings, we're, we're looking at how um, heat pumps can replace those chillers that, you know, cool buildings when it's 30 below up. We're thinking of how to retrofit existing buildings which are energy hogs or energy sieves, frankly, because they have really poor insulation or no insulation. I, I worked on a building downtown that had concrete walls, no insulation, in our climate. And basically every gap between those concrete panels is where energy leaked out. And, and um, through a retrofit, we added insulation to that building. And two thirds uh, of, of the energy used was saved just by putting a layer of insulation on it and reducing the mechanical system accordingly. So there's ways to do this. It's just it's going to take a lot of effort. So. Um, Again, th this graph is how we're going to get there. So uh, we have to, <laughs> the longer we wait, the steeper the slope to come down on the emissions is. So um, basically, we're trying to maintain uh, the idea that we, we can influence this by making smarter choices right from day one. And uh, again, as an architect and a person who helps clients build buildings that last for at least 50 years, maybe more. Um, we, we, take, we take this argument to our clients to say, your building is going to have a minimum life of at least 50 years. Like even a, a shitty strip mall <laughs> can probably last that long. So why would we design a building knowing in less than a decade we're going to be off carbon-based fuels with the same systems? So we are beginning to show building smart, sustainable, net zero energy, regenerative buildings will help alleviate the risk of your future costs of natural gas prices that spike because of the carbon tax will become so high it will no longer be relevant as, as a fuel option. We actually already know by looking at shale and Alberta natural gas prices, they're, they're dwindling. There, there is not a single shale gas or um, well that is actually profitable right now with natural gas prices at three dollars per gigajoule. Like, that's 
kind of scary. So we have to begin to convince people the best thing to do is to create carbon taxes that start to put a stick to people to get them to change their thinking and change how they design and how renewables are going to be a lot cheaper even in the next 10 years. We expect the cost of renewable energy, so solar panels or wind power, to drop yet another magnitude in the next decade. So 10 years ago, we, the, the price I would have paid for solar panels is three times what it is today. And it's like a microchip. It gets better and better in efficiency and the cost gets cheaper and cheaper. So we're trying to fight and the whole idea that we have really cheap natural gas, especially in our province, and especially with our government that thinks oil and gas will save us all, um, is, is a, it's, it's kind of like, uh, okay, maybe I should crawl under the desk now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what, what gets me going is the actions we have the opportunity to, to deal with as a city and as, as leaders in this industry. So our city said and has modeled if we wanted to deliver on the Paris Climate Accord by the Edmonton Declaration is we have to make our buildings net zero energy by 2025 in five years, all of them, commercial and residential. And it's a bit uh, ambitious, um, but I'm up for the challenge because I've I, I've already been able to show we've done it. Like we have the most number of net zero energy homes in all of Canada here in Edmonton because people like Peter Amarongan innovated and, and made the first prototypes down in Riverdale at their equilibrium house. Um, we have uh, clients of mine who developed a net zero commercial building in the south side uh, with geo exchange and solar and showed that it can be done at a, a modest increase in price, not a massive increase. And there's an economic opportunity for all this. So the one thing I think I, I find strange about our government currently is we don't talk about the economic opportunity of energy efficiency alone in helping create what's called the Green New Deal or the green economy. So we can create 100,000 net new jobs across every sector of our country if we start to use these ideas to make this transition. So this should not be about creating more oil and gas jobs, because there will be none, because the global economy does not want oil and gas anymore. This should be about creating green energy jobs across the, the globe to be able to deal with our emergency. So very, even for Alberta, we, we can increase our GDP and create 6,000 real jobs in a year to be able to do that. This is a slide from Energy Efficiency Alberta. And uh, to, to, I guess, put my cards on the table, I'm a board member of Energy Efficiency Alberta which was again developed by the previous provincial government where we were helping industry transition through programs, capacity building, and even helping very, very large emitters in industry, especially in the oil and gas sector, uh, become more energy efficient. And just in the three years, uh, the previous three years where we were funded by the carbon tax, we showed that every $1 invested returned $3 in the economy. It created those green jobs. It created a difference in terms of carbon reduction. And it created $475 million in economic growth. It saved 3.4 million tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it did this through that carbon levy that the NDP uh, per, I guess angered a lot of people by increasing the gas price like two cents at the pump. So somehow that was uh, a hill to die on for them. It is uh, kind of sad. But anyhow, 
Uh, I'm going to quickly jump to some of the things that um, gave me hope and talk about the things that we're working on. So uh, just leave more time for discussion, but any burning questions or thoughts? I'm glad you're all still with me. No one's, no one's slammed the door yet. All right. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, I guess, yeah. Um, I've heard a lot of stuff about, uh, like, with Tesla cars. People compare um, kind of, like, gathering the resources for the batteries to using gas in a car. Yeah. So with the zero, the net zero homes and buildings, yeah. would there be, would it, would it be a damage to the climate gathering just resources just to store the energy in those buildings? Like, you were saying the generators or, or power banks or something like that? So the, the way a net zero building would store energy is through the grid. So whenever you generate more energy than you use, you actually put it on the wires to sell it to your neighbor who needs it. Oh. You, you basically put it on our electrical grid for anyone to use that electricity when it's needed. Uh, so you don't really need to invest in batteries, but I understand your point about resources. We have to be smart about how we harvest silicone, how we harvest uh, the essential building blocks of like solar, or how we harvest lithium. There's a huge debate on how do you ethically mine lithium in problematic countries that, again, this is a just and equitable transition question. Where do we want to buy those resources from, right? So, it, there are problems to solve, but it's it's still, uh, at the end of the day, the carbon equation for me is paramount. Because if we don't cut off fossil fuels, we're hooped. Good question. Any others? Yeah. Can things like air and water move across provincial boundaries? Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you and others are working um, with, with larger government agencies as well as smaller ones uh, to, um, relative to legislation that might uh, trump the uh, uh, reductive kind of thinking that goes on in some way. Yeah. Um, well, essentially, we have to recognize, I guess, n we, we're one of the lucky ones. Um, so that the very first, uh, one of the first slides where I showed where, uh, where we are in that Paris Agreement, we're one of the top 10 in the world um, emitters of carbon dioxide. So whenever people say, oh, well, China or India contribute way more, it's like, yeah, but we're in the top 10 out of 200 countries. So we have the, we we still have a huge part to play, and we have to get over the the boundaries or the us and them question. We have to think of we we have the economic and and frankly the innovative capacity to to help solve these problems. We we need to start to share the that capacity or that intellectual resource with uh, not just ourselves but. Uh, the world, and it's a hard thing to, to kind of differentiate where to stop and start. We kind of need to think uh, as a global community. So, um, but that's a super hard question, Ruth. Is there something you feel like the energy efficient Alberta at a national level? Um, well, energy efficiency Alberta gets a government in terms of how the feds actually fund some of our large emitter programs. So we are actively working with the federal government to acknowledge our huge industrial emissions in our oil sands and in our very carbon intensive resources to try and help that industry minimize its damage. But other than that, it's, it's a really, really tough sell at the moment. I just came from an energy efficiency Alberta board meeting right before this meeting. Um, we, we haven't even been, been able to talk to the Minister of Environment and Parks about how we can help him reframe, even in his own language, of jobs and economy 
how, how this will help Alberta. He, he doesn't want to hear from us, and it's like, crap. <laughs> anyway, I want to talk about happy things. Can I talk yeah. about happy things? <laughs> so, um, I, I'm doing this again because I have deep anxiety. I have a son who uh, is 17, and I, I even it scares me that in a year's time he'll be an adult and have to maybe fend for himself, but nonetheless, I, I do this because I need a future for him. And we were uh, very, very fortunate this time last year to get our very first client, uh, which is All One Sky and the Edmonton Metropolitan Region, um, to uh, give us the opportunity to design a website called the Climate Resilient Home, which is just about to launch. So uh, if you want, you can see it at climatehome.ca. But essentially, again, Edmonton and our region has acknowledged we're going to have to get everyone to start to adapt to a changing climate and um, <clears throat> basically help people figure out how to start thinking about ways to make their homes, whether they're existing or new, um, or a renovation, deal with wildfire, flood, extreme weather, and changing ecosystems. So <clears throat> we basically had those four risks to, to help people map out, and we began to uh, basically list all of the things in a home that people can influence from the roof down to the foundation in terms of all of the things they could possibly do, down from insulation to deal with extreme heat and extreme cold, but we're actually going to be worried more about heat, <clears throat> down to even the plumbing systems and how the water of your, of the, of the rainwater of your house needs to be thought through so it doesn't flood your basement when we have extreme rain events. Uh, EPCOR has actually, in the last year, uh, released citywide flood maps. So you can now go see how bad your infrastructure is in your neighborhood and how risk uh, or likely of a risk you are for an extreme weather event to cause a flood in the street and therefore your house. So we're mapping out ideas, <coughs> excuse me, of how uh, people can start to use the landscape to hopefully mitigate that by creating plants that soak up moisture and creating channels or bioswales to direct water away, and creating heating and cooling and other elements to make that happen. And we're also um, happy to work on other idea generating uh, competitions like last summer there was the missing middle uh, design competition the city had where we were um, working with Avid Architecture um, to create a, a, a multi-generational development to help show how you could take single family homes in sort of the uh, central McDougal next to Kingsway uh, in, in a more smarter, uh, more aware way to create housing. So create density with it being sort of not too big, but not too small, to encourage uh, the elderly to live with the young, to encourage um, a migrant or, or refugee families to live with uh, locals, to, to create these intersections of generation and connection that we haven't seen yet. So we developed a whole bunch of different co housing ideas where people can share a kitchen and a dining space amongst different units to make these units more compact or to create ideas where uh, someone who needs assisted living could uh, basically have help from someone going to Nate, which is nearby, who would like to earn some extra money by helping them keep house or prepare meals or to do other things. And we worked with uh, a social housing agency called Right at Home to develop these scenarios and ideas. And unfortunately, we didn't win the competition because we, we lost on the technicality of how much the city should charge for the price of the lot. We kind of told the city they were 
kind of asking too much, and we said you should sell it to us, basically for the price of the the, the house that or the five houses on that lot instead of trying to charge twice the price of those houses, knowing that they would get more density and therefore more taxes. So we kind of um, argued a little bit with them. But it created a really good discussion of how, um, how the city and how industry need to create more collaborative or, or dialogues where we can test um, some of the, the pro formas or the financial thinking that kind of hinders our current city from densifying. Um, another neat project we're working on right now is called Fair Community. It's a food waste social enterprise where our client is, is, uh, is uh, a chef who worked in the developing restaurants in Vancouver and Calgary and kind of got tired of that uh, rat race and said, I want to do good in the world. And as a chef, he saw a lot of food waste uh, within the restaurant industry, but even more so within grocery stores. Because grocery stores basically dumpster or bin everything that exp or is close to expiry that doesn't get sold on the reduced you know, kind of shelf. And he said, what if we created an opportunity where I could help new up-and-coming chefs um, with sort of a teaching kitchen or a, a, a food hall concept where we get free food from grocery stores about to bin all of this waste, well, all of this food that actually should not be waste. Because as soon as you cook something, it has even a longer life or a longer uh, ability to, to make something and then freeze it or, or consume it right away. So he created agreements with a lot of co-op grocery stores to be able to take that food waste, put it in a teaching kitchen, and in a food hall where chefs would incubate or test new recipes, and, and then create this community building to harness it. So he wanted to have these kitchens where there's training, and you can even take classes in them, um, and basically have co-working kitchen space. So you, as a, a new food entrepreneur, could could buy a small food stall, or you could buy an office, or buy part of a kitchen to test out ideas, and even office space. <clears throat> and then, essentially, his headquarters would help basically develop this social enterprise by coordinating with not just the, the people learning how to cook, but the people who actually need food. So he would coordinate with the social agencies in the inner city of Calgary to deliver all of this cooked food from food waste to homeless shelters. And it's like, holy crap, that's the most awesome thing I want to be a part of. So we're slowly developing the, the ideas for this building. I'm hoping we have uh, a site. I'm going to Calgary next week to, to check out a potential site and maybe get the financing to be able to pull all of these really amazing people together from the entrepreneur and the, the chef who wants to develop an idea to the actual social agencies who need to feed people who are hungry to the grocery stores who basically throw out millions and millions of pounds and therefore dollars of food every year. And um, this, this has the hopes of becoming a, a, a carbon neutral building. So we want to explore how we can make it out of wood, how we can incorporate these ideas of showcasing the garden, the, even the, the local place where you might even grow your microgreens or grow your produce on site to complement some of the, the food we get from these, these supermarkets. And so I, I'm pretty pumped of, of having the ability to, to work with people on that. 
And then this is this is kind of one of my geek out projects because I um, uh, I guess my my carbon guilt is I like airplanes. <laughs> so um, I've I've been uh, delighted to be invited by Harbor Air out of Vancouver to help them figure out their electric uh, future. So this is, this is really neat in that um, they took one of these small float planes, single engine, and worked with a company out of Seattle called Magnix to pair batteries that were finally at a certain weight and an electric motor to be able to take this thing off the ground. And uh, so I'm going to just jump to a quick video on, on what they're up to because they just last month test, uh, tested out this idea. So it's the world's first all electric float plane. The flight may have just been 16 kilometers from takeoff to landing, but those four <coughs> minutes make history around the world. That flight was just like flying a beaver, but it was a beaver on electric steroids. The CEO of Harbor Air, Ray McDougall, was behind the controls of his electric float plane and compared it to driving a Tesla. The electric motor is almost instant torque. The 1956 De Havilland Beaver has been retrofitted with an electric propulsion system provided by Washington-based Magnix. The operating costs of an electric aircraft are anywhere between 50 to 80 percent cheaper per hour. Fuel is way more expensive than electricity. A normal float plane is noisier, not to mention smellier, with all that fuel. This is the quieter electric version, minus the emissions. Sustainability really is driving all of this. Uh, it, it, it knows that we have to become more sustainable uh, as a group. It's actually coming across this right now. The e-plane revolution has begun, albeit for short hauls. In 2015, the Airbus all-electric twin propeller successfully crossed the English Channel. Then in July 2019, Israeli firm Aviation launched its prototype Alice, a commercial all-electric passenger aircraft expected to travel 650 miles by 2022. Magnus. So I'll just uh, yeah tell you a little bit more about that because it's, it's really neat that a small little tiny company in Edmonton has the opportunity to do, um, do work for something kind of hopefully world changing. So we, we are working with them be, to help develop a new process of their, the flow of how they will maintain electric planes next to their combustion engine planes. Because they'll take two years just to get through the regulatory framework for Transport Canada to even allow them to take passengers. In the meantime, we have to figure out, they have three different hangars at YVR and Vancouver International to, to combine their operation. And we are trying to show them they actually will save space because they don't have to do oil changes anymore. They don't have to top up all these fluids that combustion engines need. They don't have to do the routine maintenance that every 100 hours because of the unreliability of combustion <laughs> engines. Instead, they have batteries and they have a motor to ensure it works. And so we're, we're working with them on a, a lean process and an ability to take, this is their beaver, uh, take out the engine, stick in the electric motor, which generates, believe it or not, 750 horsepower. Um, and can fly for up to two hours on a, a charge of the batteries which are stored. The only downside is uh, planes uh, that use fuel burn up the fuel and you're able to take a little bit more weight. So they're compromising some passenger or passenger luggage in order to do this. But as I mentioned, just like solar, the battery technologies we're seeing are ever evolving and we, we feel that in the next decade they'll, they'll actually be sufficient and small or light enough to, to make a, an amazing impact. But just to summarize, we're, we're really hoping to work through innovation and lean processes and efficiency to, that 
I've shown in our kind of destructive design and construction world to, to help clients establish regenerative buildings or, or systems or airplanes. Um, we're hoping our building codes will catch up to be able to deal with the city's idea that all, net, all buildings must be net zero in the near, very, very, very near future. We can already see that in step codes, which are uh, building codes that ramp up uh, energy performance requirements in, in British Columbia and even in Ontario, believe it or not, where they're actually saying every year we're going to increase the requirements for efficiency or the, um, the building's energy use. And then we must still encourage and, and have these climate targets and we have to talk about a carbon tax that will create the stick to drive that change. And we have to look at seriously how carbon-based fuels, natural gas included, are, are going to dwindle or are going to become expensive or, or going to be banned entirely as, as ways to do that. And, and finally, cheap renewables. We have a hell of a lot of case studies just right here in Edmonton about net zero buildings that harness the sun through solar or even through passive design principles that can really work to our advantage. And um, hopefully we can convince it's all possible. This is one particular um, uh, framework by Architecture 2030 that helps designers and architects achieve carbon neutrality. So it actually basically looks at how we can use this in all aspects of the, the building's energy efficiency and construction to be able to achieve that. So we're not trying to reinvent things, we're just trying to use um, the things people have put before this. So just lastly, we need to demand a better world. We need to really push the resistors, uh, the war room, the people who disagree that the science is correct <laughs> to, to be able to do this faster, but also do it in a way that is just and equitable, and, and we can show how that also helps our economic outlook or environment. And I think that's where I'll stop. So